So, this is going to be, I'm taping this, but I'm not going to write everything down physically in notes. So, you might want to look at the, so close up Chromebooks here. Let's have a look at this. Uh, this will, the video will be better than the notes on this one, probably. I'm going to just write over the top of this stuff, and it won't show up in notes. Okay, so what about this? If we're taking the limit here as x approaches positive infinity or negative infinity, and we're just trying to evaluate this limit, what happens? We've got two terms. Let's see hands here. Somebody help me out. I want to, I want to see from everybody, plan on contributing something today, everybody. Got to raise your hand at least once. Okay, what do you got? First term will go to zero. Good. So first of all, as x goes to infinity, that first term is going to go to zero. And then what about the second term? What's going on there? Okay, so it, it's going to explode, right? Because I've got I've got an x on the top. And so we know that we're going to get something infinite because of that x. As x goes to infinity, that's going to get really big. What's the sign going to be? Negative. Negative, good. Because I've got, I'm going to positive infinity, and so I'm going to end up with a negative 1 times positive infinity, right? Over a positive number makes it negative. Did everybody get the sign stuff? Yep. Okay, so the sign of that term is negative and the term is exploded. So that's our answer. Okay? All right. Another one. Okay, how about something like this? Oops. So. Okay. <clears throat> What's that? Mm, we don't have many work days. You get maybe some time to work. I'll give you Monday could be a reasonable day to get a little bit of work time. Um, so what about this one? As x goes to negative infinity, what do we got there? So let's see hands up. Yes, sir. Okay. And what's what's your thinking on that? What's how do we diagnose this? The factor of x on top is greater than the one on the bottom. Okay. So that's the going to go up way faster. And since the difference between them is odd, we're going to keep the negative sign. Okay, so so this is an example. We got a rational function here. Let, let's let's restate that. We got rational function, so we got polynomial over polynomial. They're both monomials this time. They wouldn't have to be. Here, let's look, what if we change this and we get one. could be like that, right? They don't have to be single terms. They could be multiple terms. But the polynomial on the top is a higher degree than the polynomial on the bottom. And that tells us that we're not going to get a horizontal asymptote, right? Okay. Uh, and so then all we have to do is look at the ratio of the leading term. So that's, whoops, what am I doing? So that's the part right here that's interesting to us, right? x squared over x in the leading terms means it's going to explode as we take an infinite limit. And what's the overall sign going to be? We're, we're approaching positive infinity this time, right? And so we know that the x's are going to give us positive over po the, the top term's going to be positive, isn't it? Right? I get 8 times a positive number squared. Bottom one, I get 4 times a positive number, so that's positive also. Positive divided by positive is positive. Make sense? All right. How about something like this guy? What do we think? Yes, sir. Two. Two. Good, good, good. Okay, good. We get rational function, polynomials at the same degree. So if we look at the ratio of the, once again, if we look at the ratio of the leading terms, the x's cancel algebraically, and we're just left with 4 over 2, right? So it's the ratio of the leading coefficients if we have same degree polynomials top and bottom. Easy, right? Piece of cake. Those are pretty quick. So I'm going to throw some at you now that are a little tougher.
So what about stuff like okay, what about something like that? Let's talk about that one. It's not a rational function. It's not a polynomial over a polynomial, right? But the bottom is a square root of a polynomial. Right? And so we can still think about this. The limits at the ends are still going to be dominated by the leading term inside the radical. Right? And so we can think of this as being equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity. On the top, all we need is the leading term. On the bottom, all we need is the square root of the leading term. So we end up with the square root of x to the fourth. Okay. So what's the overall strength of the bottom going to be when you think about this? A square root of x to the fourth, that's the same thing as x to the fourth to the one half, right? Everybody agree? So that's going to go as x squared, right? Top is x cubed. So what's that telling us about the overall behavior of this thing then? If the top is a larger power of x than the bottom, what's going to happen? No. It's got to go to infinity, right? It's got to explode. So we know that we're going to get some infinite answer. The question is just what flavor of infinity? So x is approaching a negative number. So what's the sign? Let's just play the sign game. What's the sign of the top going to be? Five times a negative number cubed is negative. negative. On the bottom, we get a negative number to the fourth, which is positive. Square rooted is still positive, right? So the overall sign is going to be negative. OK, see how we do that? Okay. Skip down, and how about these last ones are kind of tricky, aren't they? Okay. So think about that one a little bit. Yes, sir. Is it negative one? Negative one. Yeah. How'd you get that? <laughs> so the cosine doesn't matter because it's only going to oscillate between one and negative one. So then you slip at the two x's and they're the same power x to the coefficient. Perfect. Okay. Everybody see that? So in the limit, in the limit that x goes to positive infinity, the fact that the cosine is bounded, it doesn't go to zero, but who cares? It's still bounded between some finite values, right? Whereas the terms with x's in them are going to explode. And so this is equal to, you don't have to write this out, but everybody see this is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 3x over 3x, and that ratio is just negative 1. Right? Okay. Make sense? Okay. Locally speaking, it's going to look weird. It's going to jump around a whole bunch. It's going to oscillate when, we're, when x is you know, small values. We're going to see that cosine superimposed on the function. But for large values, it just gets suppressed. You don't see it. Does it ever stop wiggling? No. But it wiggles on such a small scale that, uh, hang on a second. Yeah, that's right. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. OK? Make sense? Yeah. OK. Let's try another one. Okay. How about that? Julio, what's that going to be? As x goes to infinity. What's happening on top? Sine and cosine, are they getting infinitely big? No. What about the bottom? It, okay, it is. So what happens then if the top is not getting infinitely big, but the bottom is? Zero. 
Make sense? Bottom explodes, top doesn't, it's got to go to zero. Okay. Once again, the top, it's weird because the top isn't constant, right? Doesn't matter though. It's just, it's just wiggling on a small scale. The bottom gets huge. Okay. Uh, okay. How about even weirder yet? That's not weird enough. Mm. Bizarre. Okay. Yeah, quick, what's the answer? 84. 84, that's it. Oh my gosh, what if it's really 84? Because it is. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we got to think about this now. Now we got to start actually thinking about what these functions look like, what a log function looks like, right? So if x goes to infinity, We've got a composition here of a common log or base 10 log of something, right? So let's look inside the log function and see what's going on there, okay? So as x goes to infinity, what do we, what's, what's happening inside the log function? Really, why? What's going on there? So inside the red bubble, as x goes to infinity, what's that approaching? I got a rational function, same degree on the top and the bottom, both x squareds. That's it, 1 over 100, right? So we'll take the ratio of the leading coefficients. Everybody see that? So inside the red bubble, we get a 1 one hundredth, and so then we end up with with negative 7 fourths plus the base 10 log of 1 one hundredth. Okay, so now you got to think back to your logs a little bit, right? What's that mean? So what's, if I write 1 one hundredth as a power of 10, what is that as a power of 10? Okay, everybody agree? So that's negative seven fourths plus the base ten log of ten to the minus two. Okay? Let's just focus on this part right here. So when we talk about logs, think what that means. Let's just take like if we were to set this whole this whole expression equal to y. Okay, so if I had the if I had the statement y equals the base 10 log of 10 to the minus 2. What's that mean? It's another way of restating that. Remember, if you go clear back to algebra 2, what power equals 1 over 100. Right, so remember the statement I told you to remember, clear back to algebra 2, you always remember a log is an exponent, right? So the log is always equal to the exponent. So if I were to rewrite this as, a, as an exponential statement, Here's the base. The base is the base, whether it's the base of the log or the base of the exponential, right? So the log is equal to the exponent, so y must be the exponent, right? So we'd write this as 10 to the y equals, oops, whatever's in the log, right? Does that make sense? Make sense? Okay, so the answer is negative two. And the short way of inspecting that would just be to say, yeah, what's, so we've got to say if it's a base 10 log, we're saying 10 to what power is 10 to the negative two? Well, 10 to the negative two is 10 to the negative two, right? 10 to what power is 1 one hundredth? 10 to the negative two, okay? The negative seven fourths is still Say it again. The negative seven fourths Well, it, it Eventually, we're going to have to add that to whatever our answer. All we've really done is we've just evaluated the log part of this. Yeah, the negative 7 fourths, there's no x in that, is there? Right? So when we take this limit, the log of a constant, or excuse me, the limit of a constant is just that constant, right? So that part never changes, really. This is the only part that we're going to have to evaluate when x does something, right? 
And so we end up then with, now is everybody okay with this part? Okay, the other way you could do this, well, let's finish it and then I'll go back and talk just a tiny bit more about logs, the job you're thinking about logs. So all this stuff just ends up being a negative two, and so our final answer is just negative seven fourths plus negative two, so that's negative eight fourths, so negative 15 fourths, that's it. Okay. So the other way you could think about a log here is you can think about it algebraically. If we say, let's just summarize this with the variable y, so we're solving for y then, correct? Just like we did here. So if we have the statement then y equals the base 10 log of 10 to the minus 2, think about the algebra associated with logs and exponentials. How do you undo a log? What's the inverse function of a log function? It's, well, it's an exponential function, right? LN just means just means base e log. That's all it is. This just happens to be a base ten log, right? So if we want to undo a logarithmic function, and let, here I'll tell you what I'm just gonna I'm gonna make a copy of this, and I can write more stuff. that in general, let's, let's take a natural log for example. The natural log, if y equals the natural log, which is the log base e of x, then we know if we exponentiate both sides. If I take both sides to the power of e, e to the y would equal e to the base e log x. What happens if I take an exponential function of a base e log? Yeah, they undo each other. They're inverses, right? So these guys would cancel, and I'm just left with x. Okay, the other, we can go both ways with that, too. We could say if we started off with y equals e to the x, how do I undo a base e exponential? Base e log, right? So if I log both sides, the log of y equals the log, natural log, so the base e log of e to the x, they cancel, and I just get x, right? And I can do that with either, you know, base e's or base b's or base tens or whatever. If I said uh, y equals the base 10 log of x, if I exponentiate both sides with a base 10, 10 to the y would equal 10 to the base 10 log of x, those cancel, and I just get x. Is stuff ringing a bell last year? Okay. okay. So then, and this is the way I prefer to do it, honestly. So then over here, we could just say, if I want to solve for y, and just remember what y represents, y is just everything in the orange bubble, right? They were trying to simplify, right? So if we want to simplify, we want to solve for y, we could just exponentiate this thing, right? We could do a base 10 exponential of both sides, so we could say 10 to the y equals 10 to the base 10 log 10 to the minus 2, and those cancel each other. So 10 to the y equals 10 to the minus 2, y equals negative 2. Either way, doesn't matter. 6 to 1 half doesn't matter. Right? Okay. Is there any other? Maybe just one more here. There's one that involves an arctangent function. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's... I'm not going to do arctangent. I want to do something different. Let's do, like... Um, there's one that involves uh, the bottom being raised to the power of x. Yeah, I'll let you guys struggle with that one. Let's just do one of these. I have to okay. So which one... Which one... Let, let, me, let me look at... Was that problem 11 or problem 12? Okay. I just... Where the bottom is taken to an X. Is it that one? 
No? Not that one. Not that one. I don't know which one it I don't know which one it is then. Where which number is it on your assignment? Um, my assignment is number eleven. So okay, let me just look. That one? Yeah. That one? Okay, so what is, here, here's the hint I'll give you on this one. So let's just look at this part on the bottom. What is that? 3 to the negative 1 third x. Okay, that's 3 to the negative x over 3, which is 1 over 3 to the x over 3. Pretty great. And it's, right? Because the bottom, everybody see that? That one over, look, look at this, look at that expression. As x goes to infinity, 3 to the x over 3 is obviously going to infinity, isn't it? Right? So 1 over infinity is going to go to 0. Right? So that term is just going to 0, isn't it? Right? So that's just Well, because what, what's a negative exponent? It goes to the other part of the fraction that's positive, right? So 3 to the negative hand is just 1 over 3 to the hand. Okay? Yeah. There you go. That's what it told me. I understand why. Okay? That makes sense? And, it, and all you're doing, so, so the, why are, why did, I mean, these are pretty hard questions. Why did I put these on here? Because what I want you to do is I want you to focus on the part of this expression that's going to do something in the limit at infinity, right? The only part that's doing something is the part in the blue bubble. So what's the behavior of that part of the function in that limit, right? Okay. All right. Okay, so what about, I'm going to make one up then, like this last one. Uh, okay, so let's try... Okay, let's try instead, let's try something like, I'll just mimic this. How about if we do, well, let's just do the limit of arc secant. As t approaches negative infinity. So we got to do a little quick review of lowercase a, arc functions, right? Actually, this probably should be a capital A. I'll be a little less that way. Because we, we can only, talk to me about arc secant. What's it look like? Inverse of secant. So inverse, of, inverse function for secant, right? If I graph a secant function, what does secant look like? Okay, so let's let's say that's positive one and negative one, and let's make this like uh, 
pi halves. Yeah. And that's pi. Negative pi halves. Negative pi, etc. So secant. Now we're just let's just graph a regular secant function first. Right. So if we graph y equals secant x. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Okay, so wherever cosine equals 1, the reciprocal is also 1, correct? Where does cosine equal 1 on the unit circle? 0 pi. 0 pi, 2 pi, etc. Right? So all the integer multiples of pi, those have to be places where the reciprocal of 1 is just 1. Right? So they're going to look like uh, at 0 we get reciprocal of 1, and pi would be a negative 1, wouldn't it? Yeah. And then if we keep going out here at, so there's 3 abs pi, there's 2 pi, that would take us back up to positive 1 again, right? So wherever cosine equals 0, what would secant have to be? Taking reciprocals. Everybody agree? Where you divide by zero, you're going to get an asymptote. So we're going to get asymptotes at all the at here and here, right? Uh, no, sorry, here and here. That's where cosine would be zero. So all the odd multiples of pi halves. So negative pi halves, positive pi halves, positive three halves pi, negative three halves pi, etc. Okay, and then all we have to do, here's one quick lesson on why asymptotes are so valuable. That's all we need, right? We know that, that this thing's going to look like this, isn't it? Okay. So if we, if we want to graph the inverse, do you guys remember my trick from algebra 2? This is a good one. How do you graph the inverse of a function? Based on the graph of the function. Okay, but there's a, I gave you a better shortcut. That's hard to do. Good. Rotate at 90 degrees clockwise, counterclockwise, or clockwise. And then you flip it over. It does matter, actually. And then you flip it over the y axis. Okay, so if we rotate this thing 90 degrees and then we flip it over the y axis, what happens? Oh, it's other way, it's, it's got to be counterclockwise. Counterclockwise 90 and then rotate and then flip over the Y. So let's just track this one. This one's going to go down to, you know, like kind of here-ish, right? When we rotate it. And then we're going to flip it over and it's going to look like, you know, kind of like this. Right? Okay, what's wrong with that though if we're trying to get a function? It can't be one. Right, because it violates the vertical line test. Right? So we'll go to the next part. So the next part would be this guy right here. When I rotate this thing, it's going to rotate up to here and then up to here. Right, And then it's going to get flipped when it ends up over this way. Right? So this one goes to there. This one goes to there. Right? I want to represent the entire domain of my inverse function without overlapping. And so I'm going to pick the one, the most convenient one, which means I will just cut this thing, I'm going to, I'm going to cut it like that, right? Only it goes on forever. So now it doesn't overlap vertically, but I've hit every possible x value that I could ever have on the inverse function, right? Does that make sense? So then our the, the graph of the inverse secant. Let's just do this. My graphs are pretty bad. So let's just do this on Desmos instead. How about? So we want to do inverse arc. Or we want to do inverse secant. I think you do arc on here arc secant of x, and let's just go home, and so there it is, right? Now what we graphed? Everybody agree? Yes. Okay. So then, what were we trying to do? 
we were trying to take the limit of this as x approached negative infinity, right? We had a t instead of an x, but big deal. Let's switch the variables. So what's the limit going to be? Is this thing asymptotic? Yes. It is, right? There's our asymptote. You can see a single asymptote describes both ends of this. So where is it? What is that asymptote going to be? Yeah. I have to admit. Exactly. Whatever this asymptote is right here, when I flip that, right, I'm going to move this thing, I'm going to rotate this asymptote 90 degrees counterclockwise, and then flip it around the y-axis, the asymptote gets reflected with the functions when I create an inverse, right? So we end up with a horizontal asymptote right there at pi halves, y equals pi halves. Okay, if I graph that function in Desmos, I'll prove it to you. You know. Okay. Okay, what if we did instead? We're going to have to go through the whole process this time, maybe. Let's just do our cotangent. So what's our cotangent look like? Reciprocal of cotangent. So, so all you got to do is think in terms of what cotangent is. Cotangents, cosine over sine, right? So it's going to have asymptotes wherever sine equals zero. Where does sine equal zero? Zero, pi, two pi, right? All the integer multiples of pi. So that's pi, two pi, negative pi. Then those are going to be the asymptotes. And what's our answer going to be like? What if we took, for example, pi halves? And pi halves cotangent would equal what? That's going to be cosine of pi halves, zero over one. Yeah, good. So I'm going to get, I'm going to get a point right there, aren't I? And what if I went out to like three fourths pi? So I'm over here. Three fourths pi. The coordinates are going to be negative radical two over two, radical two over two, right? Yeah. So cosine is going to be. That guy divided by that guy. Negative one. Negative one. Right? At pi fourths down here. Also negative one? No. Pi fourths would be right here. Positive. 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 Yeah. So I get positive one. And so this probably looks familiar, right? You guys remember seeing this? Yeah. It's just going to look like that's the function. So the inverse, we could graph the inverse then. So what's this going to do? If I rotate this thing up to here, like that, and then I flip it around the y-axis, don't I get this? Do you agree? So this is the line y equals 0. This will be the line y equals pi. Do you agree? And if I take the limit of this function as x approaches negative infinity, what am I going to get? I'm just going to stick to that asymptote, aren't I? So I'm just going to get pi. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Uh, what do we 
we out of here? Ten. Can we throw one more thing at you? Yeah. Two tabs up here. Holy oh, smokes. There we go. Okay. So, what about. So, what about a problem like this? This is no different than what you just did. I just want you to see that we've already done this. Just tell me the answer now. It's written in a different way. But don't say it out loud, but raise your hand here. Consider the function below. If the end behaviors of the function are described by a shared asymptote, write the equation for the asymptote. If the end behaviors are described by different asymptotes, write them separately. If there's no asymptote, write in. So I want to know, for this function, end behavior, what's the end behavior going to be? How do I find end behavior? But what am I doing to find end behavior? Raise your hands. End behavior. Maisie, what am I? If I want to find end behavior of a function. <laughs> what am I? Ah, good. So that's the, the connection we're making is we just did this stuff, right? It's just the same question written a different way, essentially, isn't it? Right? I'm not asking you what the limit is. I'm asking you to take this function and describe what the end behavior is which you do by taking a limit, right? The right end behavior would just be the limit of f of x as x approaches positive infinity, right? Left end behavior would be negative infinity. In this case, does it matter? No. What am I going to get for my answer either way? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get one, aren't I? As x goes to infinity, the sine x is contained, but the 10x over 10x, those are the dominant terms, right? So we just look at the ratio of the dominant terms, the ones that explode, and 10x over 10x equals 1. And so, yeah, we have a single asymptote. What's the equation of that asymptote? y equals 1, right? If we were to graph this thing, I mean, you know what it's going to do, not that this is so profound. But if I were to graph this... Uh, what was the function again? I forgot. Okay. Okay, so I get 10x. Divided by 10x plus sine x. And so if I, let's just... If I zoom in on it, it does wiggle a little bit, but I don't have to zoom out very far before we can see that this becomes asymptotic, right? It's asymptotic on the asymptote y equals 1, right? You get the idea? Okay, so the next assignment is just a little extra practice. I'll make it a little shorter, but it's a little extra practice dealing with that kind of stuff, okay? It is. Whew. It's a lot of math.